On today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Jeannie Doperak from UPMC Center for Sports Medicine to talk about what should be in our COVID-19 playbook. Stick around. Let's be better athletic trainers. Before we start, I wanted to take a moment and thank UPMC Sports Medicine for their continued support of PATS and athletic training in the state of Pennsylvania. Learn more about them at upmcsportsmedicine.com. And Dr. Doperak has been helping athletic trainers navigate the complexities of our field for over a decade. Now she is literally writing the playbook on what should be considered when returning athletes to sport during a pandemic here in Pittsburgh. Dr. Doperak, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me today. So Dr. Doprak, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at UPMC Sports Medicine. Sure, um, I've been at UPMC Sports Medicine for my entire career. Um, I started there as a fellow and, and for over a decade, um, I have uh, provided service to, to our, our student athletes and, and our um, athletic community and, and, and exercising population in the Pittsburgh area and enjoy taking care of folks. Um, from a team perspective, I've had the privilege to work with the University of Pittsburgh, uh, principally the Olympic sports, so all the sports except for football, um, uh, spending time with each of, the, of those groups. And then I take care of St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to work with the Pittsburgh Steelers, especially during training camp when they're out in, um, in my hometown, which is Latrobe, Pennsylvania, uh, and getting to spend time with them. I've worked with uh, various local high schools and, um, and, and travel teams and community groups. So really the, the breadth of, of folks uh, participating in athletics, I have patients as young as six and as old as a hundred. Um, and, and I enjoy um, all ends of the spectrum uh, and taking care of people and keeping them moving, which really, you know, pandemic or no pandemic is something that's really important um, in the health of, of all of us it is exercise and movement. And, you know, the, the American College of Sports Medicine mantra exercises medicine holds true um both in covid and outside of covid yeah for sure That's awesome for sure and yeah so uh dr Dobrek, i i just want to say thank you as well i want to echo phil and say thank you for coming on the show um and uh so today's episode we're going to try to focus on the pandemic and covid19 and and how we can safely help return athletes to sport so Let's start off. Let's let's talk about the playbook. So we we've kind of gone back and forth off air and and, and on previous car, calls about it. Can you just tell us what is the playbook and how you got involved and, and and any details that you want to share about that? Yeah. So the playbook came to fruition in in the spring. Uh, we had a lot of different groups, high schools, colleges, um, travel teams, um, coming to us and saying, "Look, th this is new to all of us. How how do we get back to doing things?" You know. Remember, you know, back in. April, we were all in our houses in lockdown doing nothing. And we were trying to figure out how do we stand back up and, and what's a, a safer, not safe, but safer way to do that. Um, so we at UPMC Sports Medicine, um, along with our colleagues throughout UPMC, assembled a team of experts. And so that team included people not only in sports medicine, but orthopedic surgery and infectious disease. Our, our Wolf Center was involved, which is our COVID team. We actually had administrators involved because, of course, in all of this, there's some financial cost considerations that needed to be considered. And athletic trainers, of course, of course, were, were part of our team. And so, you know, people from sort of all parts of the equation were able to come together and, and give their um, expertise or lend their expertise to making these guidelines uh, that really we feel are minimum requirements for, for starting back to sports in the time of the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we really all work together and uh, heard back from schools, again, at all levels. We had youth play, a youth playbook, we had a high school playbook and a collegiate playbook. And, and we heard back from each level of team at the, the application and how much these guidelines help them to develop their return to play plans. I will say, you know, now getting to sit here in, in my Christmas tree up in the back, right, in December, and these guidelines were, again, first come to fruition and thought of in, in, in really May um, of this year. You know, we've now made it through what, what's been, you know, summer travel sports and, and Little League baseball going into a fall season and now starting winter sports um, with very few adjustments. It's only been recently that we have a very short addendum 
um, which really only emphasizes our main points in the main playbook. So, so I think the playbook has really held fast through this entire process. Yeah. So, you know, do you want to kind of highlight some of those main points or, and, and I would, I would be curious what um, initially, what, what were the differences between the age groups um, yeah. as you returned? The differences between the age groups really involved, um, you know, if you think about our collegiate sports and, and, and what goes into taking care of a college team and, and the things like they're living on campus. And so it's thinking about their living situation and traveling. So when a lot of our college teams play, I mean, again, I take care of the University of Pittsburgh um, and my basketball team is in Miami right now. So they had to get much to Miami and we had to think about a hotel and eating in Miami and, and how do we accommodate um, sort of all of those uh, parts right in the middle of COVID and protecting people um, you know it, whereas a high school team probably is not flying to Florida routinely for their game right but they are going across town and they are interacting with another community and how do we keep them safe you know versus a youth team and interestingly you know it, there's sort of an in-between there because while high school teams are playing within the community a lot of our travel teams are going you know across state lines and, and I have talked to you know I know folks um, I have two children at home and they play on teams and um, they have friends who played this summer in, you know, in Delaware and in Virginia and Florida and Tennessee. And so there is some travel involved, but normally when you're, you know, when you're 15 years old, your travel doesn't involve going by yourself or with your team, it's with your parents. And so in a youth playbook, we, we think about the fact that the parent is driving the process. Um, whereas in the high school playbook, a lot of times the kid and the administration or coach is driving the process. And quite honestly, at the collegiate level, it's very independent of the family, right? And so uh, that we need to think about what they're doing at, at that point. The playbook guidelines, I will tell you, I mean, it really comes down to the messages we've been hearing all along through this pandemic, which is wearing your mask. And so we really emphasize that um, wearing your mask when you can. So, you know, recently uh, the Department of Health had come out and said that they wanted people to wear their masks all the time, like even with activity, mm -hmm. um, where we've said, you know, you, you can try to do that. And if you can, that's great. But if it's restricting airflow, if it's, if it's putting you in more danger. So in some sports, the mask may impair vision. So thinking about a gymnast, right? So if, it, if they're not able to see everything they need to see and then not able to um, catch the bar or land appropriately on the beam, that obviously would be way more risk than not wearing a mask, right? And so, and when my gymnast is on the beam, I would like to think that there's a, a pretty good perimeter and no one's right on, you know, as far as a six foot perimeter, no one should be within that circle at that time. Um, and, and so, but, but anytime you're not, certainly, if you can while participating, great, but absolutely anytime you're not participating. So on the bench, in the locker room, on the bus, everyone should be masked, masked up appropriately. And, and coaches and our staff, so our athletic training staff, our physician staff, really, really emphasize that they should be wearing their masks at all times. Um, the second point is that six foot perimeter. And so, uh, you know, I think sometimes people who want to sort of be picky are like, well, what if it's five foot 11 inches? Well, right. I mean, on average, we look at sort of this six foot perimeter and say that that's where we should, should lie. And so, you know, spacing things out so that we're not sitting right on top of each other on a bench and that locker rooms are, are thoughtfully um, designed this year so that kids are, again, aren't uh, right on top of each other. And that means, you know, again, in our youth playbook, as athletic trainers, you guys know, sometimes it means that the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade are like all cramming into one locker room at one time, uh, you know, and, and again, you guys have been there, right? 13, 14, 15 year old boys, it's like, rah, right? And so, uh, you know, it, it maybe means, hey, let's just send the seventh grade in at first, then let's give them a set amount of time, right? Like you guys have 10 minutes or you have five minutes, get your stuff, get out, right? And, and then we send the next group in. So it was just being thoughtful about spacing and that remains, remains true. And then just good sanitizing procedures, which quite honestly, we've known hand washing prevents disease for like <laughs> centuries, okay? I mean, this is not a COVID thing. It's an right. illness disease transmission. And so, you know, washing hands, hand sanitizing, um, you know, you know, cleaning equipment, cleaning spaces, you know, all of that becomes really the foundation. And those are things we've heard over and over and over. And, and we keep saying, and they're really the things that have been the foundation of, of prevention, um, you know, of the virus. Yeah. Um, and, and you talked about it a little bit there, um, disease transmission. And so we know there are some surface contact issues, right? Like you could touch something that has the virus on it and, and touch your face and, and that, but it's mostly airborne. Is that accurate to say? 
Yeah, and so it's, it's really, I would say it's, we have gone really away from the fact that there's gonna be a lot of transmission with contact. So at first, you're right, like everybody um, was wiping their groceries down with Clorox wipes, right? And, um, you know, or I know folks, I know someone that sent their husband to the grocery store with Clorox wipes to wipe down the handle of the freezer before they opened it, <laughs> uh, right? And again, and I'm with you, I mean, people wore yeah, gloves. We didn't know. Gas. You know, um, you know, we were worried and we didn't know, to be right. fair, I'm not judging anyone. Right. And I think you do you, we don't know, we didn't know and we're learning. Right. And what we've learned is, is there's, there's really much, much less transmission through that contact through disease. So, so, you know, I'm less worried about people touching like the basketball as opposed to being next to each other. Um, it's the respiratory droplets that are the big yeah. concern. So can you talk a little bit about that? And, and, and so my understanding is, you know, there's a viral load. There's almost like a threshold, right? So because people talk about, okay, masks don't work, but we know we, they do, or in my opinion, they do. Um, but, you know, obviously there's going to be some nanoparticles or small droplets that can get through. But is, is there, is, is it about viral load and how much of it gets through or in trying to minimize that? Can you explain a little bit about masking and how that works? It is. I mean, it's about, I mean, so again, the, the virus is transported in a respiratory droplet. So as gross as it is, is that you spit, right? And then the spit <laughs> goes into the air and it travels. And then in order, you know, you're basically breathing in someone else's spit um, and it has virus in it and then you get the virus, right? Yeah. And, and so you, you're right. I mean, when people get down to it and they say, well, a cloth mask versus an N95 mask, is there this, you know, micro, micro nanometer particle that gets through? Yes, there is. However, in the big picture, you know, where we get these big droplets and they're being transported, those are being blocked. And I'm with you anecdotally, um, you know, I wear my mask all the time. I've been around, I take care of college students. And if anybody has looked at numbers as far as COVID and infections, college students are pretty high on the list of people who have been infected with COVID. So I have been around a number of people that have been infected with COVID. I, I, by wearing my mask, you know, keeping my distance when I can and, and washing my hands, um, I have yet to have, have gotten COVID. How do I know I haven't gotten it? Because I am in um, a, a bubble with the athletic department. So I get tested uh, several times a week because of that. Okay. And so if I were to get COVID, I certainly would, would know. Um, so so with, with certainty, I can, can tell you that I have not had a, a positive test and I've had a lot of tests and I've been in these bubbles really since June of this year. So, um, so you know, and I've been wearing my mask the whole time. So I, I would say, you know, I know masks can be, you know, it's not, I mean, I don't love wearing my mask. Um, right. it, it sometimes hurts my ears at the end of the day. It can be a lot. I sometimes feel like, oh gosh, I, you know, on certain days I get it. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't want to get COVID and, and I want to bring it home to my family. And I certainly don't want to pass it on to someone who maybe is more vulnerable than myself, an older individual. Um, so I'm really diligent about wearing the mask. Um, and more, you know, again, for myself, but also for the consideration of people around me. And so I think that's, you know, I've said all along that I think when we think about COVID and, and taking precautions, if people could use some common sense and be considerate, right? So, you know, think about those around you and, and, and kind of say, hey, I, you know, there's a, a big orange sticker on the floor here denoting six feet in the grocery line. I, I'm just going to do my part and stand on the sticker, you know, right? It's, 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 it's really not political. It, it's just no. six feet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you say, common sense, be respectful of others. And, and, and yeah, maybe you're not afraid of it, but you don't know who, um, you know, that person in the grocery store line has to go home to and, and what their right. vulnerability is. Right. So yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Dr. Dobrek, what do you think the biggest challenge we face as practitioner is during the uh, during this pandemic? There's a lot of challenges, Phil. <laughs> um, it's been, I mean, sort of, I think my my mantra has been every day is an adventure, um, right? And I think that keeps me, and I, I also, I, you know, I feel for all of us out there, I'm sure I'm not the only one that gives myself a little pep talk. I'm fine. I'm fine. I will be fine today, right? Like, um, so there's lots of challenges. What's the biggest challenge? I think it's um, it's the not knowing. I mean, this is all new. I mean, in the, in the very beginning, you know, early, early on, um, someone said, it feels like we're making this all up. And, and I was like, we are, uh, we are making it all up. I mean, we're, we're using as much science as we know, but we're learning as we go. And, and we're doing, you know, we're, we're giving people the best information that we can based on the knowledge that we have at that point. But the knowledge is evolving and, and we continue to 
to answer questions, but we also continue to ask questions. And so, you know, I think each each phase of this has more questions and, and, and some more answers. So as we even said earlier, right, early on, we were wiping off groceries and thinking that, you know, surface contact was going to be a problem. We've learned that that's not as much of a concern as the respiratory droplets, but now new questions come up. So even, you know, what we see just this last week, right, a vaccine has been approved, people are starting to get vaccine, then that's great, but that opens even more questions. So more questions are, um, how long does the vaccine last? We're not sure. Uh, we're learning those things, and so, um, so I think the challenge, Phil, is the, the the absolute total newness to us, and, and, and having to say we have never been in this situation, nor did we ever learn about it. Like no one in school said, "Hey, what are we going to do in a pandemic?" Right? Like yeah. I don't know about you guys. Is that part of your athletic training curriculum? Because it wasn't part of my medical school curriculum. Um, <laughs> you know, we talked about disease. We talked about viruses. Yeah. And, and we certainly talked about the history of medicine, but you know th this is unprecedented. So we we are definitely learning and and um, and becoming better and, and doing the best that we can. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Um, I, I and, and appreciate that information. You know, let's let's kind of maybe go back to the playbook a little bit. And and you you discussed the highlights, right? I think we got the the key points, right? Masking, social distancing, all the things that we've been been you know the the message that we've been saying the whole time. Any other key points that, that you could think of or, or maybe misinformation that, that is out there that, you know, maybe not as, as, as successful as you, you thought it was going to be? You talked about some, some modifications that you guys might be making. Yeah, I mean, we've released modifications, which really emphasized the, the points that I just said, the masking, the social distancing, the sanitizing. Um, I think one of the things that we've also said in the, in the, the addendum is, you know, each school is going to need to assess where they are at any given moment and make, make decisions based on their individual communities. And in some cases, if, if it means hitting the pause button for, for a minute for a team or for an, a whole school or for a conference, sometimes you have to be willing to do that. And, you, and you'll have seen that we did that even at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, you know, we, we were uh, pretty transparent with when we had to make those decisions in the media. And so, you know, right before, um, between Halloween and the ACC men's soccer tournament, um, we had a little hiccup with, with some um, infection in our men's soccer team. And, and the soccer team had to hit the pause button at what was the most inopportune time. I mean, right before, I mean, they were, were ranked number one in the country going into the ACC tournament. And, and we had to say, we got to shut you guys down for a minute because we can't let this perpetuate. We have to stop this, the, the disease spread and contain it. Um, and we knew that that was the right thing to do. Um, was it hard to do? It, it's always hard. I mean, imagine, I mean, it, it's hard anytime. In that situation, it's really hard, right? But, but we still always do the right thing. Um, our number one priority is always the health and safety of our student athletes. And, and we put that above all else. And, and you can see that in our action. And, and so but by by taking that small time out, we were able to get everyone healthy and, and then honestly get, you know, just get everyone to the tournament. They were able to participate. They made it for the first time ever to the finals. Um, they ended up losing to Clemson in the final, but I mean, with everything they went through in those weeks upcoming, I mean, really impressive stuff from them. Um, so, so I look at that as an example or, or, or give that to as an example because, you know, it means sometimes we do need to take a, a, a short pause when it's appropriate. And I think those decisions need to be made really school by school and even team by team because when we, when we had that issue with men's soccer team, it didn't mean that we shut down basketball, right? Because basketball was fine in that moment. Now, does it mean that we won't ever shut down basketball? I, well, I hope we don't ever have to, but, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't if we had to. Again, our number one priority is, is the health and safety of our student athletes. Um, and we put that above really all else. Um, it, we want to see them play and, and, and there's certainly lots of benefits to playing from mental health to physical fitness, um, socialization, right? There's, there's lots of reasons that playing sports it, it is helpful, but we're not gonna do that at the expense of any of the athletes for sure, or staff or anyone that's around the community at large. Yeah. So right now in Pennsylvania, you know, as a state, um, our, our governor, our department of health said, hey, we need to hit the pause button for a minute. Um, and we have to respect that because they looked at it, it, it statewide numbers and said, you know, th this is what makes sense for the health of our community. Um, is it a hard thing to do? It is. Um, does it 
frustrate people and make them upset? It, it does because, you know, it, not everybody understands and it does, it feels bad. And trust me, my kids were, were not uber happy when, when their sports got shut down. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, it is sometimes what has to happen for the greater good. Yeah, to- totally agree. And, and yeah, I have a son as well. And he, he was not super happy about not being able to play basketball. And, but, you know, you, you have to make those adjustments. Um, but speaking of the adjustments, I mean, is there a magic number or, you know, is there an algorithm that you're looking for that, you know, wh- when do you pay- push or when do you put, pu- put things on pause? Um, and then also what, how long is that pause? You know, is it yeah. one week? Is it two weeks? What, what do you recommend? So, um, you know, we've talked from the beginning, uh, more as a conference. So the Atlantic Coast Conference, the ACC, they have what's called a medical advisory group and we have a physician group. And so, you know, as a conference at that level, um, we talked very early on, especially we we talked a lot about football at first because football was going to be the first teams back. They came back in early June. Like, do we have an algorithm? Like, when do we have X number of people sick? You know, is it one and then we shut it down? Is it five? Is it 10? Like, when do we when do we say enough is enough? And what we decided was, was that there wasn't a one size fits all. And as I, as I kind of keep coming back to the individual community in school needs to decide when they reach that threshold. And so, um, you know, when in, in, and so in each case, and perhaps this is some of the art of medicine, which has really come into play with this. Right. There's not we, we don't know. There's not science. Right. And so we have to look at it and say, you know, we're going to err always on the side of being more cautious and conservative because the last thing we want to do is have more people get sick that didn't need to get sick, that we may have put them in a precarious situation. Um, so erring on the side of caution, we sort of look at our numbers and say, okay, you know, how can we keep people safe? And when do we feel like it may be unsafe? And I will tell you, you know, in some cases it, on a team, it could be one person, but then it, it, when we contact trace them, it affects more people. And we say, okay, again, time out, right? But in some cases, it's more than that. Um, and we can contain things and, and say, all right, we don't need to shut everyone down. We need to shut this portion down um, for a short period of time. You know, when, when we look at sort of how long do we need to shut down? Also, you know, again, that's not a one size fits all. But what I will tell you is, is the magic number in all this has been two weeks. You know, why is it two? Like, where is 14 days? Where does this 14 days come from that we all talk about? 14 days quarantine, right? 14 days, you know, oh, if you travel outside, if you travel and you come back, a lot of places say we want you to quarantine for 14 days. Well, where does that come from? Well, where that comes from is that in early research with COVID, um, a lot of people or many people will get sick after being exposed to the virus at day five. So after five days go by, um, many people get sick. Most people get sick by day 10. All people get sick by day 14. All right. So if you make it through 14 days and you don't get sick, you're good. All right. You can feel good. It's like your own little COVID test. I've been in a cabin in the woods for 14 days by myself. I've been exposed to no one and I haven't got sick. I don't have COVID. All right. And and so that's where we come up with 14 days. And so in a lot of cases, you know, that's been our parameter. Now, um, recently, the CDC narrowed those quarantine windows and they did that. Um, and they narrowed it to 10 days it, because as I said, many, most, most people get sick by 10 days. And they even went so far to say, you could come out of quarantine in seven days if you get a negative test. Um, so testing can come into play. So if, if after you know five days of exposure, you get a test, it's negative, you, you can feel certain enough, or the CDC tells us you can feel certain enough that you don't have to stay quarantined, that you're not a risk to those around you. Um, at that point. So, uh, you know, again, one of those things that has evolved over time, but that's where those numbers have come from. Yeah, that's awesome. On the, the questionnaire, we, we wanted to talk about um, how to treat a positive test. And, you know, um, what, what does that look like at the different levels of, you know, we talked about the, the youth, the, the high school and the college, you know, maybe break that down on, on what the, the quarantine looks like, contact tracing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so when you divide it up and when we talk about sort of the different things, when, when someone is COVID positive, so they are the sick individual, they are the person that has the, the virus, they go into what we call isolation. Isolation is 10 days um, and it's away from other people. So at the college level, uh, it means that we've had a, a specific dormitory um, that, that, that these folks go into and that they're in the isolation dorm. Uh, they don't leave. They have meals delivered to them. There, there's 
Um, there's a lot on social media actually about different colleges isolation in the meal. Like there's, I feel like that the students are really um, like really critical of the food that's delivered to them in isolation. Uh, in many ways, I'm like, oh, it looks pretty good to me. But, um, but I guess if you're a college student, maybe they're not as happy with all of it. So, but they would get their meals delivered. They wouldn't leave for 10 days. They're, they're in isolation. Um, and that's it, it, the collegiate level because again, they're not living at home. So we have to provide them with a space that the university or the college has to provide them with that space. All right, so um, if you're at home, if you're a high school student, then you quarantine at home. And ideally it would be in a, a room that, that would have you know, your own bedroom. And, and again, ideally your own bathroom. Now, not everybody has that situation. And, and I will say that, that what happens in, in that situation, you know, in the high school where you're cohabitating, probably with your family, right? You're, I would imagine most high school students aren't living by themselves. Now they're isolating with their family members, which means that their family members are close contacts and they have to also quarantine. So they don't, they don't, not necessarily positive, but now they have to um, stay away from other people, you know, so that, because they may be infective. Um, and, and that had been, again, 14 days from the last day of the contagious sick person's period. So that's where it gets confusing. So, so if you, so if I get COVID and I'm in my house, my kids and my husband, would I would only have to isolate for 10 days, but they would have to quarantine for 24 days because it would be 14 days past my 10 days, okay? Um, because we all live together. Now, if I would get sick and then I would have the opportunity to go live somewhere else, like in an isolation dorm, I would stay there for 10 days and then my family would only have to quarantine for the 14 days. And that's what the CDC has recently narrowed. And they've said, okay, if you go and you isolate for 10 days, then your family only also has to isolate for 10 days or seven days if they're able to get that negative test. Um, again, those are really pretty, those are brand new guidelines within the last couple of weeks from the CDC. Um, and so, and so that's what, you know, when someone's sick or, and that's what we do. Uh, so ideally you're able to separate the sick person from the healthy people um, to allow the healthy people a shorter time period uh, away from the, the, you know, the population. So using yeah. COVID antibody testing or COVID active testing can severely cut down the time that say like the high school uh, kids' families would have to quarantine because if you could identify it early, you could start the process early. So it really only cuts it by three days. And just to clarify, okay. Phil, it's not antibody testing. We make no decisions based on antibody testing. Okay. It's only a, um, a, a really ideally what's called a PCR test. So there are two yep. kinds of tests that people get in the community. One is a PCR test. That's the nasopharyngeal swab typically where um, it, it goes like people, uh, my college kids say like, oh, it's a brain biopsy. It does not touch your brain, <laughs> it, it, but it does go pretty far back into your nose, right? Um, it feels, I have had many, 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 many nasopharyngeal swabs over the last several months because of the testing protocol that I'm in with athletics. Um, I will tell you, it feels like getting water up your nose. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people say that, like when you jump in the pool and you get that big of water up your nose, that that's, it doesn't hurt. It really just feels like there's water up your nose. Um, that PCR test is not a rapid test. And so it, it gets right. sent to a lab. And in most cases, it can take even several days. It, it can take several days to come back. And most labs, these right now, today in December, are, are getting it turned over in a few days. Um, a rapid test um, is an antigen test. Um, and so that can be processed on site and sometimes can be available within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, it is not as accurate a test. Either way, so there are what we call false negatives where um, you have the virus, but it comes back negative and lo and behold, it missed it. But there also are false positives where the test comes back and says you're, you have the virus, but actually you don't. Um, and we've seen that both ways um, with more of that testing being done. So anytime you have a positive, um, well, if, you have a, if you're sick and you have a negative, oftentimes that's followed up with that PCR test. Or if you have a positive, it often is followed up with a PC and you're not sick, right? I feel fine and, and I have this positive test. Um, they send it uh, a PCR test to confirm it, um, especially in athletics because in, um, for instance, in the big 10 right now, 
their testing protocol is for their, their in-sport athletes, high contact in sports. So their basketball players, for instance, are getting daily antigen tests. And um, in talking to my colleagues in the Big Ten, they, they've had a number of false positives. So when they have a, a kid that gets an antigen test and it comes back positive and they feel fine. Now, if they're sick and it comes back positive, it is what it is. We're just going to call a spade a spade off to isolation you go. Um, but if they're feeling fine and it comes back positive, we still isolate them and we're still going to take all the precautions, but that they get a follow-up PCR test in order to confirm the antigen test. Um, so you have to be careful about that. So to go back to your original question, Phil, um, what happens is, is that if you have the test, um, you only have to isolate seven additional days. So 17 days, as opposed to 20. Um, so, you know, three days is three days. And so, uh, I mean, it is what it is, but for some people, they may not have access to testing. Um, they may also have an expense because maybe they're somewhere where they're, um, because they're asymptomatic, you know, uh, they're not having, they're not ill, then the test is not covered by insurance in some cases, mm -hmm. I've seen that. And so, um, you know, they don't wanna pay the money for the test. So it's three additional days. Okay. Um, as far as athletics, I know you're working inside the bubble, but one of the questions that we, we kind of had was who gets tested, how often, and how many tests are being done? Yeah. And so it depends on where you are. Um, so as I just said, the Big Ten is doing daily antigen tests on their players, and they're using PCR tests as their confirmatory method. Um, in the ACC, I think all of our schools actually are doing three time a week PCR testing um, of our bubbles. And so they're, and they cannot be on sequential days. So of our in season high contact sports are doing three times a week PCR testing. Um, that's been our model, which has worked so far. Um, I wanna like knock on wood somewhere. It's worked well for us. Um, but, but those are the, the, the two models that I'm most familiar with because those are the schools that I've, you know, of course, Pitt is an ACC school, so I'm most familiar with our model um, that we're using. Now, I, I will say um, other, you know, the NCAA, if you look at their documentation, especially for basketball, they want a three time a week test. It can be PCR or antigen. So some of our schools in the Pittsburgh area, I know are doing three time a week antigen testing and then following up. Um, with a PCR again to confirm um, positives. Um, and, and, but you know, all of this comes at a cost. And so these tests for athletics are not covered by insurance. Um, they're being paid for by the individual institutions. Um, and also I think to understand, you know, these are being done by labs that are not generally labs taking care of the general community. So um, so it's not like our athletic labs are being processed in place of like, sick people's labs. They really are what we call boutique labs that are just taking care of athletics or, or just there, they were, have been built solely for the purpose of, of the job that they're doing in sports. Um, they're not going, like, I just, I don't want people to think that like our tests are going ahead of sick hospital patients tests because right. that is not happening. And that's something we talked about from the very beginning that we were not going to be taking resources um, away from, from people that, that would need them. Um, and, and that's not been the intent, but, but each individual college and university or school is paying for those tests. Um, so what that's meant actually is that some schools who, who would really like to be playing, um, you know, based on the NCAA guideline, you know, they're just, are not the financial resources because it is expensive. Each PCR test on average costs about a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars per test. Um, each antigen test, you know, it, it, you have to buy a machine and the machine costs about between 10 and $12,000 um, at this point. Yep. And then each of the tests is about um, $35 on average, um, somewhere between 35, 45, sometimes 50. And sometimes if you buy in bulk, you can get them a little cheaper, but I'm going to say on average, $35 is what I've been hearing. So, you know, three times a week, Think about your teams, right? Yeah, like, and it's not just yeah. the, the coaches and it's not players, it's your bubble, right? So it's anyone that's coming in contact. So as an athletic trainer, y'all would be getting tested. Um, you know, it would be, you know, in our case at Pitt, it means that the, um, you know, the, the guys at the score table are getting tested. The officials are getting tested. Um, anyone that you see. So when you, if you watch a, a Pitt basketball game, anyone that you see on the lower floor, like within the perimeter of the team, they're all considered tier one and they're all within our testing bubble and getting tested. So, yeah, it, you know, it can be a lot of people and get expensive quickly. 
it sounds like it. All right, Dr. Dobrek. So um, now that we we've kind of we've tested the athletes, we know who's sick, who's not. We have a nice bubble kind of contained. Um, we have things at least under control as best that we can in the situation. How do we go about practicing? Uh, I know Pennsylvania recommends smaller groups um, to limit social gatherings. How does that affect us in athletics? Yeah, and so you know, early on when we brought our pit football team back. We had, and again, in the playbook, what you'll see is we have a, a phase um, return. And so we say, okay, in phase one, which they're all two weeks, we talked about that 14 days and why it's important. So we had uh, a quarantine period followed by a small group period, followed by, you know, again, talking about football, we know that that can be over a hundred kids, right? So we went from really small groups, we're talking like, you know, more than 10 kids. And then in phase three, we went to 25, like groups of 25, and then we were supposed to go to groups of 50. Well, it was during that time frame in the summer that, that the governor had said, you know, we don't want more than 25. So we actually had a longer period of time where we had groups of 25 before we went to groups of 50 in our phase, simply because of our governmental regulations. And so I think everyone just needs to pay attention to, you know, the, the recommendations from the departments of health of the states that they live in and, and make group assignments accordingly. What I will say though, is, is that I have found teams have had some benefits in practicing in pods. So when you're able, and obviously at some point you have to bring your whole team together because you, you, you have to just, I mean, it doesn't work otherwise, yeah. right? Like you have to have everyone together, but you know, when you're able to, to have, especially when you're doing close contact and unmasked, you know, having pods of people, you know, while it doesn't, um, well, you know, how does it limit disease spread? Well, if, if one person is ill, you know, then they don't spread it to 30 people, they spread it to five people in their pod. Or, you know, from a team perspective, when you contact trace and, and you're deemed a close contact, if you are within six feet for greater than 15 minutes without a mask. So, you know, what that does for you as a team is maybe it means that you don't now have, you know, 15 people in, in close contact quarantine, you only have four people because you were practicing pods at five. So I often encourage our, our coaches when they are able to have pod or family, they've deemed them sort of different titles that have smaller group practices um, because in the end it, it may help, um, you know, if, if someone does get sick, it, it helps limit that spread. Yeah. What, yeah. Do, you, what do you think about um, the, the concept of splitting your pods based on position versus splitting your pods just based on a bunch of other people. So like, for instance, like football, if you have all the linemen in, in one pod and you just take out now the entire no lineman crew. You have no lineman, right? Yeah. right. So you, we, when we said that from the very, that's one of the things that actually came up from like day one. Hey, when you guys make the pods, you make them how you want, but we would not put all the safeties in the same pod, right? Because now if there's a problem, you have no safeties. Um, and so we, we sort of, you know, when we talk about pods, oftentimes close contacts, and you guys know this from your teams, like kids cohabitate, right? So girls on the soccer team live a lot with girls on the soccer team, right? And so, um, so making your pods, you think about, well, those are going to be close contacts anyway. So if, if Susie is sick and she lives with Nancy and Beth, right? Nancy and Beth are going down with Susie because they live with her. So really putting Susie, Nancy, and Beth in the same pod at practice also makes sense because they're already going to be connected. And we think about that even as much as like things you didn't even think about bus seating or plane seating, like who sits by each other on, on a, a trip, you know, even though they're masked, it's a lot of time next to each other. Right. And so we worry about that. So if we're not, if you're not able to space out, you want to thoughtfully think about where you're sitting people and where you're putting them. And so again, there, there is more thought put into people's position um, in various activities here, activities this year than I think ever before. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do at Dickinson um, is we, we are actually having the ath or the coaches form the pod and then we are going to house them together as much as we can. So that way the pod is the pod, right? They're living together. They're playing together. Right. I mean, you're going down anyway. Like you're, you're like, if you're living together, I mean, I, I will tell you cohabitation is one of the big ways that this gets spread. So, you know, if you're a roommate, you're, you're going to go and, you know, into that contact quarantine yeah. for sure. I was gonna say, at least you're going to quarantine. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
kind of going off of that, you talked about the the close contact as being the, you know, within six feet for 15 minutes. Um, we talked a little bit on the, on our pre-call about the, some of the stats of how, you know, how, how close are we getting to our opponents or, or our teammates during athletics? Um, one, can you share some of that data with us? And mm-hmm. then two, is it published anywhere or do you know of any other studies that are published? I know I, I saw one from rugby, but you know, anything within yeah. America that has been published that, um, on, so know, there's a that study like? on so- European soccer that looked okay. at, at, at on-field soccer contact. And then we actually, again, I, I already said we had some, um, some, t- some things come up with soccer. And so we had an instance where we actually had to sit and I say we, and I, uh, the coaches, actually the coaches um, had to sit and watch game video. It was stopwatches, right? And time out the amount of time when people were within a six foot parameter. Um, it turns out that the longest during a game, a 90 minute game, the longest any two people were within six feet of each other was 96 seconds. Now I knew it would be less than 15 minutes. I didn't think it would be less than two. I'll be honest, right? But they're constantly moving, right? They're in space, out of space. Now, um, to take that one step further, um, in uh, ACC, in the Atlantic Coast Conference, on the basketball teams, um, each school has invested in a system called Connexon, and they're basically GPS devices. The NFL has been using this all season. Um, So we GPS track the players, and, and so we have really good data to say, okay, you know, if, you know, number 13 gets sick, we can immediately pull up computer data from the last 48 hours. Who was within six feet of number 13 for more than 15 minutes, right? Again, surprisingly, less than you would think. Now, basketball is more than soccer, but but again, we're, we're and we don't have a ton of, you know, we're right at, we're at the, um, at the front door of our basketball season. And so I suspect as time goes on, we'll have more objective data to share. Um, I have heard that out of Seattle, um, Kim Harmon, who's one of, one of my sports medicine colleagues in Seattle, it sounds like is trying to maybe put together something to publish, you know, on that, right? How close are people? I think that we um, in the ACC probably have enough data amongst soccer in our teams to show that on-field transmission is not the place that we worry about. Um, you know, and even in the NFL, you know, if you look, the, the Titans sort of had this, you know, notorious pretty big outbreak recently. And, and that came to surface on a Monday and they played the Vikings on Sunday. And, and as far as I know, the Vikings, at least they never released that they didn't have any positive as a, as a result. And so, and, and I will tell you through the fall sports in the ACC, we have no known on field transmission of virus. This is anecdotal, right? But, but, you know, I meet with all the team physicians and everyone says, no, you know, where, when we contact trace these kids out, it, it's been very clearly social situations. So, you know, parties being probably the number one, yep. but um, sleepovers, uh, but even, you know, they'll go to a meal, right? They'll all go to brunch and they're yep. sitting at a small table with their masks off. And so again, it, but it's social situations yep. that, that far and away have been the, the culprit. And, and so we can say, I mean, in your experience at, at your work areas at this point, you know, even like not even within athletics at all, it's, it's outside of the, we'll call it the bubble, right? Like, you know, meetings are, are socially distanced and masked mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, sidelines are masked and socially distanced, right? So like on field doesn't seem like it's a problem. If you're using the correct um, mitigation strategies outside of that within athletics, we're not really spreading it. Is it fair to say that within athletics? I think it's fair to say that anecdotally up to this point with the sports that we've played, because remember, we're just starting the winter season. So I, I don't know that I can speak, you know, indoor for, versus outdoor, right. For basketball. And, and now volleyball, women's volleyball played in the fall. They were inside. Um, but for, for our fall sports, we did not see transmission of virus in our athletics bubble. Um, right. So you're exactly right with the appropriate mitigation. So if a team didn't follow the rules, then they were more at risk. But but whenever they were following the guidelines um, within under our roof, um, we were able to uh, feel as though we were keeping them as safe as we could. Um, it definitely was outside of our watchful eye where things went amok. Yeah, right. Which is expected, especially for college age students, right? That's, I've that's learned very quickly that you cannot take the that part of the you just can't do it. <laughs> you yep. can't take it out of the equation. 
Yep. Can't take college out of college. Can't take college out of college. <laughs> no. As hard as you try. <laughs> but yeah, so that was awesome. Um, that you know, I, selfishly, I, I wanted you to say that just so that I have that in my back pocket um, when I talk to other people. But um, the next big story or the next big issue is okay. You know, we we have we've we've identified who and how and and what somebody gets the the, the COVID. And now we need to return them to sport after they're asymptomatic. Um, some issues with myocarditis has, has come up. There's some other, you know, respiratory issues, obviously, with with the disease. What are your thoughts on return to sport, and how can we do it safely? Yeah. So early on, um, early early on, there were some issues uh, brought to light with the possibility of an increased rate of myocarditis. Now, recognize that myocarditis is not a new entity. There's been myocarditis around as long as there's been viral illness in a heart, which is a long time, right? And so we've had cases of myocarditis in athletes um, after just the common cold, um, just so you know. Um, what the thought though was, was when they looked at really the sickest of the sick patients, right? So we're talking about people on a ventilator in the ICU for weeks and weeks, they had a higher rate of myocarditis and how would that translate to the, you know, the minimally symptomatic collegiate athlete? And, and we didn't know. So again, remember in May, we don't know. So we need to err on the side of caution and, and take every every precaution we can. I mean, we don't want to put someone out there to, to, um, to I mean, myocarditis can lead to sudden cardiac death. So we, we do not, we're not in the business of putting people in, in harm's way. So um, a lot of that research was published early on by a doctor named Dr. Kim. He's a cardiologist out of Atlanta. Um, he actually is affiliated with Georgia Tech. Um, in Georgia Tech as part of the ACC. So um, I had the privilege very early on of having conversations with Dr. Kim through that relationship. You know, he um, said in, in so many words, we don't know, right? And, and so um, they didn't think that it would translate, that it, that it would be as much in the asymptomatic athlete, but, but because we didn't know, we need to do due diligence. Um, what that led to was in the ACC and many conferences, um, a cardiac um, algorithm that we follow that at the end of the, the contagious period, so the end of 10 days, um, we are getting lab work, um, blood work that, that shows some of the cardiac enzymes. We look at an EKG and an echocardiogram on each athlete to assure that there's no cardiac abnormalities. Um, we uh, at the University of Pittsburgh have been part of a data collection on this through Harvard. Um, a, a, a physician in Harvard is doing uh, a mass collection of data from various universities who've been following. Um, up to this point, th there's been very few to no cases of myocarditis reported post-COVID. I can tell you up to this point at the University of Pittsburgh, um, we have not had any cases of myocarditis. Um, interestingly, um, uh, talking amongst my colleagues, there was one case of myocarditis, which was from mono, not COVID. Um, so take that, um, a COVID, uh, right? Chalk one up for mono, I didn't want it to be left out. I'm like, no one's talking about me anymore. I need to do something. So, um, so you know, again, it's something we, we definitely worry about. And recently, you know, within the last six weeks, the, um, the uh, American College of Cardiology has in fact lessened its um, it's guideline, and they're, and they're now saying for the general population um, that the echocardiogram, if you're asymptomatic or mild symptoms, is no longer needed. Now, if someone's really sick and they're in the hospital, then before you return into play, you really should do the, the entire process. But we're, we're starting to be able to pull back a little bit on our testing um, necessary because we're realizing that um, it, it may not be as prominent as, as thought in May. Again, we're learning, right? Every day, yeah. learning, learning, learning new information. Um, as far as returning, we, we do have, um, we normally don't just throw someone back to play because they've been out, right? They were, I mean, sick or not, they've still been in isolation or quarantine for anywhere between 10 and 14 days, right? So, um, so anytime we have someone off, be it from an injury, right? Or, or if you think about concussion, I think concussion is a really, really good um, parallel to this. If we have someone with a concussion, we, we, we don't just throw them back in, right? Clear from your concussion, go, right? We, we have a light day, you know, how do they do a moderate day? How do they do a heavy day, right? We, we take them through this progression and we're doing the same with our COVID kids. So in a lot of cases we say, okay, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. And, and at any point, if someone 
is having trouble, right? If I have a kid that's at 50% and they're struggling, I'm certainly not going to push them on to 75%. I'm say, let's spend another day at 50, right? And, and then see. And so again, it's the art of medicine to some degree, how we progress kids. I work with an unbelievably talented pool of athletic trainers who have been immensely helpful in, in, in that process. Um, in addition to our strength and conditioning staff um, at the university, but, uh, but honestly, like I, I can't say enough about um, the athletic trainers I get to work with because they've just been phenomenal. Um, and so, so we get them back in, in that manner. And the sicker someone is, the longer it's going to take. Again, it, it, it's again, it's like anything. The longer you're out, no matter it's what it's for, you know, you're, you're going to ease them back in. So, are you at, at, at your collegiate settings? Are you um, doing the the enzyme testing and the echo for everybody? That we has are. symptoms. So we're still or for in everybody. the ACC with our medical advisory group um, because we are part of this data collection right now through through um, it's called a registry right through Harvard. Um, we're waiting for some of that data to officially be released to change our algorithm. So right okay. now, each of our pit athletes gets an echocardiogram, an EKG, and cardiac enzymes. Okay. Okay. Um, what about a high school athlete? Where, where do you get, what are you, yeah, what are you so recommending? Question. Where do you draw the line? Right. Mm -hmm. And so what's mild, uh, think, what's you know, moderate, right. Mild to moderate. And I think, you know, they're seeing their um, primary care doctor, you right. So as a high school team physician, I'm not seeing those kids to return them to play. Um, like right. I do the college kids, um, they're going to see their primary care doctor. And so uh, hopefully their primary care doctor, you know, I would think that um, at a minimum an EKG in a high school athlete would, would be, um, would be warranted, especially okay. if they had more than mild symptoms. Okay. And then you also, you mentioned like the percentages, um, is that a percentage of heart rate or a percentage of workload? What, what are you? You know, I would say it's a combination of that. Right. Okay. And so I think it's just kind of overall like 25% workload heart rate. I mean, we're just sort of saying, look, we want to be kind of a quarter of what we normally are. Gradual um, and, return, I, and again, yeah. I, I think of it more like on that concussion return. What like again, mm -hmm. and when I return people with concussion, you know, it, I don't even put a percentage. I say light, moderate, heavy, um, you know, and that, and that looks different to different people. But if we were going to kind of nitpick um, and need to have numbers, you know, that's what I would assign to it. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, at the time of this recording, uh, we just got the vaccine released uh, a few days ago and Pittsburgh had their first um, uh, inoculations uh, yesterday and the day before. Um, so the vaccines, how, how are these ones working? Um, all, all across the news, they're the mRNA vaccines, which is different from the other ones that um, I know that I've gotten when I've uh, been growing up. Um, how does it work? Yeah. So all the other vaccines that we've ever gotten in our life, okay, they um, are made by taking either um, a, a small, sorry, um, a small part of a dead or um, deactivated portion of the virus. They, they actually have to grow the virus. And so, for instance, the flu vaccine gets gets grown in in hen eggs, which is why people with chicken allergy actually can't get the flu vaccine. You're saying yeah. it, right? So or egg allergy, right? So, um, so they grow it in there and then they take that small portion of, of dead or deactivated virus and they inject it into the body. And then the body um, basically makes a, a, an antibody response to the smaller portion of that virus. So, so in some cases, because you are injecting actual virus, you know, it's rare, it's very rare, but there is a potential to perhaps, you know, get the disease from the virus. Now, again, not like you're gonna get polio from the polio virus, but but like flu, some people can get some mild flu-like symptoms from the flu virus, and that happens sometimes. People generally don't get fulminant influenza, though. Having said that, the mRNA virus works by a completely different manner. So messenger RNA is injected. It basically doesn't send a portion of virus. It sends instructions to your cells, okay? So it sends instructions to the cells that make proteins to make a portion of the viral protein. In this case, it's the, the, the spike protein, which makes the crown of the coronavirus, right? We call it corona because it means crown. So now the body is programmed to make that protein so that the body then makes that antibody response. And when it sees it again, it says, aha, I recognize you. I'm going to fight against you. It, it basically teaches the immune system how to respond. So you absolutely Ooh. cannot get the virus from this because it doesn't, you don't have any of the virus. <laughs> it, although this is the first of its kind, it's not new. 
We've been studying mRNA viruses for a long time in oncology. And so cancer research is really focused on using mRNA inoculation to help treat um, cancers, uh, various cancers. And and they've had some success, you know, in the lab on that. Um, So this is the first really, you know, widespread practical use. I think one of the things also people would say about the virus is what, you know, or about the, the vaccine is, are you worried it's been so fast? It was developed so quickly, right? It happened so fast. Well, um, it was purposely developed fast. I mean, there was this operation warp speed by the government where the government said, we're going to give you lots of resources and we're not going to put up all the red tape that we usually do um, to, to block this. So they were able more efficiently than ever to go through all the processes that a, that, a, that a vaccine has to go through to be approved. But they did go through the processes. And, and um, when you look at the phase three of these trials, there were, I think, 40,000 people given the, the, the vaccine. And so, but that's 40,000 people were given. So there, there was a placebo group of people that got sham vaccine, and that was another 40,000 people. So you, you had a really big cohort of, uh, of folks that, that got the vaccine. And within six weeks time, or over six weeks, there were no big adverse reactions. And, and most other vaccines have actually only been studied for six weeks when we, you know, all, all other adverse reactions have happened within six weeks of other vaccines. So we can feel, you know, fairly confident to say this appears, you know, this appears safe. Now, I mean, it, do we know, is anything in life 100%? No, it's not. Um, but, but I think we always look at risk benefit, you know, what's the risk, what's the benefit? Um, the benefit is, is that you don't get, you know, SARS-CoV-19 virus, which we've seen can be can be deadly um, in many many people. Um, what you know, what's the risk? We, we feel like based on everything we've done, it, it's low. Um, and, and so, will I be getting the vaccine? Absolutely, um, I will be getting it. Now, I think the other thing that people don't necessarily recognize or read on is, is that vaccine has not been tested in children. So a lot of people will say, "Oh, you're going to get your kids vaccinated." Now. Um, the answer is no, because they won't qualify um, because they're not of the right age to get vaccinated. It hasn't been studied yet in that in that population of folks. Um, pregnant women and breastfeeding women are another group that it hasn't been studied in. So, um, so know that that you know again, if you say, well, should I get my six-year-old vaccinated? I know that I'd spend a whole lot of time um, worrying about that right now because it's actually not approved for that group of people um, yet. Okay. Now, do we know any information on? Um, how long it is till we would have immunity or resistance to the coronavirus individually, and then how long that immunity would last? Yeah, and so there's thought that, that immunity is gained within seven days, around seven days of getting the first dose. Now, there's a need for a booster or a second yeah. dose a month later, yeah. um, and that's important uh, to get that. So you get one dose, and then four weeks later, you would get a second dose. Um, but but you wouldn't have to wait. My understanding, and from what I've read, is you don't have to wait till the second dose to get immunity. You would get okay. immunity beforehand. Okay. Um, how long will it last? I don't know. Okay. No one knows. Have to do a long term study EBD. with titers. I don't know. Yep. Okay. I mean, we need to get a booster. Will be like the flu shot that we need to get one every year. I I, yeah. I don't know. How, how do you think they'll determine that? Um, so I think they'll determine it over time, right? So what we'll do is they'll be following all the folks that have been vaccinated, especially in the study group, right? So yeah. not necessarily me when I get the vaccine, no one will follow me, but but we have these folks that have gotten the vaccine as part of the study group, and they will continue to be followed quite closely okay. over time to, to assess their immunity. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you know what the recommendation will be? Like, it, I mean, I guess we're, we're obviously just trying to get the first round in, but um, do you think they'll recommend six months a year? I have no, no idea. idea. Yeah. I, I mean, no right. one knows right now. No, yeah. I think we we're right now focused on, I mean, the focus is going to be on getting folks round one. Um, right. and that's going to be a process, right? I mean, the, we, we've prioritized, we, I mean, the government is, is rolling the vaccine out and, and, uh, the priority is going to be healthcare workers and, uh, vulnerable individuals so nursing home patients first. And that, and that makes sense. Um, and then there's really been, um, a roll down, you know, that, that'll go through folks, you know, that, you know, older, um, at risk, more frail individuals kind of down, down, down the line to, to, to the general public. Um, it's going to take time. Um, you know, I will say, I think, you know, even in my head, I had a conversation with someone this week where I was like, well, when will our students get the vaccine, right? Like when will it be available? And, and I'll be honest, when I asked that question, uh, I was kind of thinking, oh, maybe like May, right? Like that's what I was thinking. And, and the person was like, Oh, I think probably like next fall. I was like, oh, 
<laughs> I, I felt a little like deflated. Yeah, I, I, I like, mean, I, oh. Dr. Fauci <laughs> this morning said maybe like March, April was, was what he said. So, you know, I'm going to keep yeah. my fingers crossed. But... I also think no one really knows, right? Like yeah, we right. remember all new, all new, we're still yep. figuring it out. Like yeah. I, I, you know, I'm going to trust the process. And, and I think there are lots of really, really smart people working on all of this. And, um, you know, everyone is doing the absolute best that they can. And so, um, you know, it's, we're all learning every day. We're figuring it out. Right. Right. Well, right, so in the meantime, wash our hands, wear a mask, social distance, and keep an eye on those symptoms. Yes. Yeah. In the meantime, Absolutely. wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands. You've got it, Phil. Keep saying that. <laughs> Basic hygiene. There you go. <laughs> Well, Dr. Dobrak, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise um, in general and, in, and specifically on COVID-19. This has been absolutely amazing. If folks have questions or you, can you point them um, to some more information or maybe information? Yeah, for sure. So if they go to the UPMC uh, Sports Medicine website, which Phil, I know, had said at the beginning, and he can maybe reiterate that. Um, there is a link to the playbooks. So there's a PDF link. They're all there for free, the, the collegiate youth high school, and then the most recent addendum. There's also a place there to submit um, questions, um, it, you know, and those get passed through sports medicine and kind of um, filtered to the right folks to answer them. Um, and so if there are further questions, that's a good place to submit them to get them answered. Perfect. Awesome. Perfect. And I just want to say a huge thank you to UPMC Sports Medicine for their sponsorship of this episode. Uh, thank you so much. And to our viewers, thank you for listening. Uh, please uh, remember to like, subscribe, and share this podcast. And until next time, I'm Adam Richmond. And I'm Philip Hensler. And this was the Pats Podcast.